Welcome to another episode of the Roots Podcast. I am your host, Sean Pitcher. Today's guest we have on is Kyle Bellamy. He is the Assistant Director of Sports Science at the University of Oklahoma. He also has a very deep background as a dietitian at University of Miami. He was there for at least nine to ten years. Um, so really excited to go into that. You don't see someone in a position like that for typically that long at that level of sports. Um, so I'm very curious to ask him um, about his time there and how he was able to last for nine years in one location. But Kyle, welcome. Thank you. I, honestly, it's an honor and privilege to be here. So thank you for having me on. So let's get started with the question that we always get going with is, who is Kyle? Well, I... Um... You know, I'm I'm a hard worker, I guess. Um, that's probably the answer, the number one question of how I've lasted so long. Um <laughs> excuse me. Um, you know, I'm 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 a husband uh to my wife Hannah. We've been married um shoot, I should know this. O- almost twelve years now, coming up in November will be twelve years. Uh we have three kids, uh, my son who's nine years old and two six year old girls. Um, so as much as I am, you know, I would like to say I'm a, I'm a professional and, and I, I, I work hard and I enjoy what I do thoroughly. Uh, I am a family man and, and I, I really enjoy time with family and, um, you know, that's, that's kind of who I am in, in a nutshell for the most part. I don't really have time for, to be much else, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think ultimately we do what we do at the end of the day for our kids, for our family. And it's funny that you you forgot the specific years of like how long you were together. I, I always tell my fiance, like, I don't think males ever like lock that in and remember. I think always like the wife or the fiance or whoever that person is, is the one that typically remembers that. And they make sure that you remember it. And if you don't, like, it's probably going to be a big issue. Right, right. And, and honestly, I have the easiest anniversary in the entire world. Uh, I got married on November 11th, 2011. So 11, 11, oh. 11 impossible to forget i think now it's more like i'm doing the math in my head i'm like oh uh 12 years okay cool you know so <laughs> yeah ours our birthdays are, are two days away from each other so oh like, there you go so you can never forget that that and then um you know my my brother and my mother like that's the only other two people's birthdays i remember theirs are like four days away from each other besides that everything else i'm like i don't have any clue like i'm gonna have to put some <laughs> sort of reminder on my phone yeah right exactly so before any of this even happened, you played professional baseball, correct? And was it with the White Sox? Yes, with the Chicago White Sox. So I, I actually uh, started out at the University of Miami. I'm, I'm from South Florida. Okay. Um, honestly, about 30, 35 minutes, depending on traffic, of course, uh, <laughs> from campus down in Coral Gables. And it was really kind of a dream come true. Uh, I actually... You know, at the time, I had a lot of offers from a lot of other schools, um, but Miami kind of was like, hey, we don't really have a full scholarship for you, but, you know, you can earn a scholarship and we want we would really want you to be part of the roster as a preferred walk on. And, you know, honestly, I just kind of jumped at the opportunity and that was a dream come true. And so I, I ended up, you know, having the chance to play three years at the University of Miami and uh, very fortunate my junior year to get drafted by the Chicago White Sox in the fifth round and, you know, uh, kind of ended up going from there and, and really, um, you know, things went really, really well, r- really early on. Um, and then, you know, my second spring training, I'm in big league spring training and, you know, the hope and the anticipation, you know, the, at least the conversations a lot were trying to move me quickly, get me up to the big leagues, um, you know, relatively quickly and that that spring training is when I first initially I I hurt my shoulder Mm -hmm. uh ended up needing shoulder surgery I prolonged it as long as I could because my my, I mean my shoulder was absolutely killing me in 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 camp but I was like man I've I've worked my entire life to get to this point like there's no way I'm pulling myself out of this and you know sure enough it, it got to the point where I just couldn't do it anymore and MRI and you know just completely wrecked in there and um long story short about you know two years later <clears throat> ended up having Tommy John surgery uh, you know an- another major surgery in spring training that put me out for you know another significant amount of time and 
Honestly, once you have two two surgeries, I, I thought I would have a brand, you know, having a brand new arm, essentially. A robotic yeah, arm. Good. Yeah. <laughs> At least I was hoping. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm good for 15 years now. I got a whole new arm, you know. Uh, but it never bounced back the way it, uh, you know, it should have. So, you know, I had a six-year stint in the Chicago White Sox organization and, and and you know, had, had, it was very rocky up and down. And, you know, from there, um, yeah, decided to finish my degree at UM and that kind of you know, um, you know, springboarded me into, you know, where I am today, I guess. I guess when you reflect back, did you know much about fueling when you were an athlete yourself? (laughs) Uh, so initially I'll tell you what, 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 what really got me into this field, I think was I, uh, in high school, you know, a lot of times you just, you just go off your talent. I mean, not, Mm -hmm. not so much that, you know, you know, everyone is, is, is pretty solid, but like talent rises, you know, no matter what you do from a work standpoint, eat right, do what, like, it's really hard to convince high school kids they need to do X, Y, and Z. And I think that's a, a huge challenge in college is because most of these kids that are at these, you know, top, top level, uh, you know, power five college football or power five college athletes in general, you know, majority of the time they were in high school, their talent overrode anything they did to their body whether it's lack of sleep lack of fueling hydration whatever they just show up and they ball and that's mm-hmm. what they do um so i i mean I, I played baseball i we never lifted we never ran we never were even told what to eat when to eat how to eat um so in high school i just rode off my talent i got to um and that first conditioning session, I mean, I got my butt whipped. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> sure and, you did. <laughs> um, dude, I learned quickly, you know, and, and even though we didn't have a resource of a dietitian on campus or really anyone to kind of steer us in that way from nutrition, you, you start to, once you start to understand like, all right, I need to work harder. And this is a whole different level of, of work and commitment. You start to see some of the veteran guys you know, starting to eat right, or at least what we thought was eating right. Like we knew to stay away from fast food, you know? Um, And we, you know, we would tell ourselves like, oh, you know, um, you know, certain things that might be healthier than others. And, you know, it it probably wasn't the most ideal, you know, fueling tactics, but you at least knew the kind of low hanging fruit, like the the big things to stay away from uh, when it came to our nutrition, but at least I cared about my nutrition. Right. So I started to get into that. Um, and then actually, you know, one of my first years into professional baseball, I, you know, really wanted to take this, you know, my game as serious as I could. And, you know, through my agent, we ended up, uh, I ended up seeing, you know, I don't even know if he was a dietitian at that time. Um, and now knowing what I know, probably some questionable methods, <laughs> uh, of, of how, how we, especially when we initially did it, I'm like, man, I'm eating like 1200 calories. Like I get, you want me to cut uh so, some fat and 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 cut some weight here early on but man that's a little extreme really hard it was very extreme it was very extreme um but either way you know i think for a lot of athletes just having that intention and you know thinking about it and at least making better decisions than where they were right um i think that's always the starting point right you, you have to start at square one so for me is you know, whether I was doing exactly what I needed to do in the weight room or eating and fueling exactly how I should have, I had a different intent in, in my actions of, of how I, you know, trained my body to do that. So I saw my game kind of take off from there. Uh, and it was something I fell in love with. I, you know, I fell in love with the preparation of sports more so than I even love the games, you know, and I think that's where my love for athletic performance in general kind of came about. Yeah. At the end of the day, performance doesn't lie. Like you're getting these positive behaviors associations and it's raising your or enhancing your ability to do what you need to do on the field. You're probably going to want to continue to keep doing it or finding other ways that's similar to it to keep that train running. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially if you're like superstitious, you know, even like, Oh man, I I don't want to change that or, or change this. And you know now you're building really good habits. And you're like, yeah, I'm I'm never going back to the way I was I, I was doing it. Yeah, I like one of the things you said there is, you know, with athletes, you almost have to find a time when they're struggling, maybe a little bit vulnerable, or you're just out at practice watching and 
they look body body language wise they look tired exhausted fatigue maybe the coach is yelling at them more than everybody else not because they're not a talented athlete maybe it's because they're just not pro- appropriately hydrated appropriately fueled and like when you get that five to ten seconds you can pull them over to the side and say hey ask them one or two quick questions have you done this have you done this no i haven't no i haven't well hey here's some shoes real fast I think you should get a cup of water let me know how you feel in the next like 15 20 minutes and then in that situation if you can make that person feel better or at least be able to get through the rest of the practice it's like now you found them in that situation you made a change in that moment and now probably that relationship of trust is going to be a little bit more and now if there's stuff that you need to do because they probably had some really glaring um, concerns or issues, hopefully they're now coming back to you. Or if you're successful with them, now that's going to other teammates. And now the conversation is becoming between teammates versus you just telling them or the coach yelling at them and telling them to do it. Because we know when, when if it comes down to the coach, hey, you cramped, you got to go see Kyle, right? That's going to become, uh, it's, it's in a high have to do versus – I need to do this because it's going to be in the best interest. So I don't have this occur again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you nailed it right there. It's, it's, it's building those relationships and that trust early on, you know, it's having those conversations, but I think first and foremost, it's getting to know these guys, uh, you know, getting to know the athletes, building that bond, building that relationship. Why should they trust you? You know, there's so many people that come in and out of their lives, especially, um, in, in college football, you know, there's so many people that are within the organization that they see come and go. Um, and so why would they, you know, kind of trust you more than the next person, you know? And so if you have those relationships or you're with them at those times where they're most vulnerable, right? Like you said, maybe it's a conditioning session, maybe it's a practice, maybe something didn't go wrong or didn't go the way it should. And you know, I, I hate to wish this upon guys, but a lot of times I used to really enjoy when I was like, hey, make sure you grab breakfast. They're like, oh, I don't have time. And then I'm like, OK, like, good luck today at practice. And then yeah. they go out practice and they come up afterwards and be like, Kyle, I am never doing that again. I, I, I got you. I'm listening to you, you know, or yeah. like same thing with hydration or same thing with recovery or whatever, whatever the case may be. A lot of times you 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 don't wish the struggle upon them. But the struggle definitely hammers home the point, right? More so than um, you know, than than other times. But but there is plenty of times too where they're like, you know, you're like, hey, uh, why don't you try this? And they're like, okay, I'll, I'll try it. Let me see. <clears throat> then all of a sudden, after practice, after the game, they're like, yeah, that was awesome. I'm putting that as part of my routine now. Like you said, you you start to build that trust and relationship, and even that one little thing, they start to buy in and they start to listen a little bit more and now you start to really make change interventions and and implement how you how you want to implement and and like you said um a lot of times that speaks for itself within the within the you know their teammates and their position group maybe they start to see changes in you know in in johnny and all of a sudden now you got multiple guys that are wanting to do the same thing and at the end of the day you know, especially as a performance staff and really no matter where you're at in a performance staff, whether it's strength, sports science, nutrition, athletic training, you know, the more athletes that are looking to your guidance, uh, the better. Right. And, and it just, and it's more so simply because uh, at this level, and, and especially in college, they just don't know what they don't know. And they just kind of continue to do what they've always done in high school uh, and and that kind of goes back to the the talent thing is just talent overrides everything. So they don't necessarily know they need to go into the training room to get maintenance work done or why jumping on a force plate is beneficial to them or why, you know, strength and conditioning, uh, you know, is, is really that important versus going out and working on their r- running routes or whatever the case may be, you know, so um, it, it all kind of ties in and, and without that relationship, you you know you really you really don't have that uh that capability to to intervene like you want to or should yeah and some good points there you know a lot of these athletes have been doing the same habits in their environment because that's all they know or that's what the trainer or the coach has taught in them for years so ha- having the ability to redirect them everybody is going to take different levels of time 
may take a week, may take a month. I've had athletes like I had one athlete I had, you know, at IMG Academy. Um, I'm also not going to say his name, but, you know, after like two or three years, the one thing I got him to do, I got him to eat pistachios. Right. <laughs> most, most people are hearing this like you just had me pistachios. Like, what's the big deal? It's like if you if you knew if you knew the person and the fact that we got him from point A to point B, but it took that long. <clears throat> it's because like the relationship and building getting to that point, like wasn't easy. So it's like, that's where also you can't give up on an athlete. Yeah. Right. Until you get to know the behind the scenes of an athlete, their yep. body language, how they talk, why they may act a certain way. That's all happening and occurring and developing from that previous environment that they were in. So to judge them and say they're lazy, they don't care. They don't want to listen. Well, maybe you as a staff member just don't, truly understand what's going on with everything else before they even got to this point. Like, and until yep. you invest in, and actually want to do that, then probably your assumption of that person is going to continue to be the same. And that's where I see a lot of coaches or staff members sometimes will write that person off. Maybe that person just needs support and help, right? Maybe it's not nutrition strength. Maybe it's, it's for psychology before we can actually do our job. So I like that you said too, you know, you know, we have to we have to support each other as staff and the more we can support each other and the athletes can see that we're a cohesive group you know no matter who they go to because sometimes right if, if it doesn't work with you they might go to the strength coach they might go to the athletic trainer right they'll try to find that that vulnerable person in, in the group but if you're all together and all have the same mindset and, and communication hey nutrition we'll go talk to kyle hey for strength go talk to such and such like that's like that's their realm like if, if that's what we need to discuss or you need help with, I, I trust in them and like they're, they're gonna get the job done. Like I'm I'm not the person for that. Like I'm here for rehab and strengthening or whatever that may specifically be. Yeah. And 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 back to your point, I, I mean you have to meet the athlete where they're at. Everyone, you know, everyone starts out, especially coming into college, everyone starts out different, right? Whether they went to IMG Academy where they had practitioners like yourself, uh, and and structured you know, foundation of what college looks like uh, versus a kid from, you know, the inner city of Miami where they might not even have a home practice field and they're sharing equipment like that, that stuff legit happens mm -hmm. and you run into those athletes. So, you know, some guys come into college and their parents have made them eat, you know, at least what they think is healthy or, you know, they're, they love fruit and they eat salmon three times a week and they aren't afraid of veggies. And then you have some kids who I have eaten one meal a day. I don't eat this. I don't eat that. I don't eat that. Vegetables are not going to be something I put in my mouth. And you're right. Like it's little wins throughout, throughout the time. And it's, it's understanding, all right, what's, what's the low hanging fruit with this athlete? One athlete, you might, your biggest challenge might be just getting them to eat breakfast. Yeah. Or eat anything for breakfast, a banana for breakfast, like, you know, just meeting them where they're at, putting in simple steps along the way for them to be successful. And, you know, I, the big joke I would always have is like, all right, if I can just get you to do A, B and C to start out as a freshman, by the time you mature and you grow and we advance your nutrition plan, um, you know, by the time you're a junior, senior, now you might be eating you know, asparagus. And yep. like you said, like pistachios, those are huge wins because they're starting to grow and change and evolve and get to where you want them to be. Sometimes some guys just take a little bit longer than others. Yeah. You, you can't talk at the athlete. You got to work side by side with them like that, that Absolutely. old school method in the seventies and eighties. And like, you're the drill sergeant, you're telling them what to do. Like, that's just, that's just not going to work. So, I mean, yeah. as practitioners too, we're also having to change how we're educating, coaching, and helping these athletes because the mindset and how they react to things now is, is obviously much different. Um, and I like you said there too, right? Like, you know, everyone's had those athletes that ate one time a day. Well, maybe like that athlete eats fast food for lunch. That's not what we want them to eat, but now they in, in, in take calories that they weren't taking before. Right. Right. Not ideal, not what we want, but they made a change and they're getting more food in. And over time, if that gives them more energy, then maybe I can associate some better choices, right? Or, hey, right. can I get you to eat a piece of fruit with your two Chick-fil-A sandwiches, right? That's that's yeah. still better than what they were doing before. You know, no one's going to be able to change overnight in two seconds. All right, and that, that's one thing I think 
uh, you know, a lot of people in the outside world or even sometimes coaches, they, they don't, they don't understand that. They, no. they expect everyone to come in and like, if it's salmon, brown rice and broccoli, and that's the best thing for them to eat, then they should be committed enough to eat that, you know, yeah, it's like, uh, this is terrific. Why aren't, why aren't they eating this? Why aren't they, you know, it's just, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? And again, it comes down to, well, I have to get to know this person. I have yeah. to understand what they're willing to do and what not to do. And, you know, that's, that's just the, when you get to those higher levels, everyone just wants the quick result and behaviors in some situations aren't always going to be a quick result. Yeah. Like if, if that person only trusts their mom and maybe at one position coach and that's it, you know, who am I to come up and tell them like they need to lose weight mm -hmm. or they need to hydrate every day because, you know, they go out to practice and they can only last 30, 40 minutes, you know, like who am I to tell them that and, until we can get to that point where they can understand like they, I'm here to help and support them. So it, it just takes time. Everyone has obviously their different methods. Um, but hopefully listening to this, someone takes something from that. Right. So, you know, going into Miami, nine years there, how did, how did you do it? You know, cause a lot of these ACC, SEC schools, you know, the name of the game, especially when you're working with you know, football, baseball, basketball, you got to win, you know, and if we don't win, we've seen time and time again, staffs vanish, or this coach is taking the staff with them to a whole different school. And every, you know, two to three years, you know, especially if you're not winning, you're probably going from school to school to school, but you, you were able to, to get your roots into that school and stay there. How did you do it? <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, um, probably a lot of luck and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, grace of God on my side. But, you know, I, I think for me, you know, being an alumni and a, <clears throat> excuse me, former athlete, I think that that definitely helped, you know, um, being that guy that, um, you know, was very familiar with with everybody and the building and, you know, being a Miami guy, I guess, Um yeah, I went through four different head coaches at my time at UM, and and it is very rare to do that. Um, my first year, my very first year, I was a as an intern with strength and conditioning, and you know that was where I actually first got introduced to sports science as we as you know one of my major duties was running catapult uh, with alongside one of our um, assistant strength coaches, and that was 2015. And that was with Al Golden was the head coach. And Al Golden was relieved middle midway through that season. Mm. And in comes Mark Richt. And so so new head coach, new head strength coach. And I was like, man, uh, where do I fit in here? What do I what do I do? Like all that, you know, you almost get to the point where you're like, all that hard work I kind of put in, you know, now it's a whole new staff. Like, it's almost like wiped clean. It's like day one, new staff. They don't know me from anybody. So, I, I mean, I just, you, at those points, you just kind of keep your head down and you work your butt off. Um, I think being older, so I, I was after I got done playing baseball. So I was 26, 27 at the time, um, you know, being a little bit older, a little more mature, understanding, you know, the game and not necessarily having the distractions of, college <laughs> i guess yeah. outside of <laughs> outside of what i need to do you know my my son was just born um, a few months before, prior and so i you know i i knew like with that transition from baseball into the next step in life was like okay i need to go as hard as i possibly can because you know being an athlete i didn't know if i was going to be good at anything else i really didn't that was my identity i i planned on playing baseball for a long time um you know i had god had other plans but um you know, I, I, I went into it and I just, I did what I knew was successful, where I was successful as an athlete. I just worked hard. And I, I, I had that mentality of outworking everybody, um, you know, and, and that gave me a lot of really good responsibilities and, you know, amongst the strength staff in 2015, going into 2016, Mark Rick comes in, Gus Felder is the head strength coach and, you know, no nutrition, no dietitian, uh, full time in the entire school at that time. And, you know, uh, I started working actually with offensive line and some defensive linemen, you know, cause um, coach Felder, you know, was like, Hey, you know, he leaned on me for, for quite a bit, which is, 
know, I can't thank him enough for, for really, you know, getting me set up and my, and my feet wet in college athletics and, and setting me up for success by giving me a lot of really, really awesome responsibilities. So he's like, look, we're looking for a dietitian, And, um, you know, while, while we're doing that, why don't you work with some of the O-line and D-line? Like you have a background, you're, you know, in, in sports nutrition, that's where my master's was in my master's is in sports nutrition and, um, and strength conditioning, uh, kind of in an umbrella of exercise physiology. And so I was like, yeah, absolutely. No problem. And, you know, just kind of like anything else I, I do, I just was like, man, I'm going to hit the ground running with this. I'm going to really find my niche of, you know, being able to do both. And, you know, as they were searching for a dietitian, you know, a couple of people turned the job down, you know, and, and while I was continuing to work with those guys on their nutrition, um, I already had that relationship with them. You know, that was really one of the biggest things. And, and even from staff to staff, you know, and especially early on, on that one, you know, the new staff came in, I was one of the only returners, albeit an, an intern. Most of the guys came straight to me before they went to any full-time <clears throat> strength coaches for a lot of advice or, or, or anything like that. So, you know, he kind of saw the way I, I got these guys to buy in with nutrition and the relationship I had. And, you know, long story short, him and, and Mark Rick offered me the job and asked if I wanted to do it. And I, you know, I said, absolutely. You know, getting in into my first full-time role, uh, being a strength coach and, you know, overseeing the nutrition program. That was awesome. Uh, not, you know, being able to start that program from the ground up, we had, um, we had a fridge in the weight room and it was full of muscle <laughs> milk. And then we would have, you know, the little tankers full of Gatorade that the ATs would bring out. That was our nutrition program. We did not have literally anything else. And, uh, I remember when Mark Rick, um, you know, he, he, I accepted the job and he goes, all right, now, now turn it into Georgia. <laughs> and I was like, Oh man, <laughs> I was like, you want me to go? Oh, I need some resources here, my guy. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, sir. Like uh, I'll do my best. I promise you that, you know, and um, you know, it, it, it took some time. It took a lot of learning, growing, developing failures, um, not biting off more than you can chew when it comes to when you start a new program, it, there's steps you have to take along the way. And, and, you know, day one, you're going to have all these awesome ideas and you're going to be like, yeah, I want to do, I want to do this. That might be five years down the road because of, and that might just be simply because of budget, manpower, uh, resources, buy-in from the athletes, uh, you know, so you can't go straight from day one of all we have is muscle milk. And the guys, honestly, it was really, all they needed was food service heavy on the beginning, we're not going to do hydration testing and, you know, uh, well, you we're know, not going to be able to do an athlete management system, or we're not going to be able to right. do market market yes. testing and supplementation and all this. Like yeah. you, you got to be able to, based on what, where you are in the environment, like you just said, you have to be able to prior, prioritize and be realistic because For sure. you can tell that to, you know, the head coach, the CFO, the athletic director, and have an actual like built out, multi-year plan where it's like hey these are the investments we're going to have to make over time to be able to get from point a to point z that's going to be a lot more understandable versus hey i want to do all this in like one to two years this is the cost and then if that cost is a lot in a very short period of time as as you know and i know most people are gonna look at that like ah we're not doing that or like nah that's not gonna happen versus if you give them a little small thing like hey can we just bump our resources here so we can have more you know, snack protein options besides the shakes. Cool. Did we improve our body composition? Did weights improve? Are our guys happier? Are we able to tie some analytics behind that to show that there was an actual change by adding these different resources? Boom. Now we're just adding brick by brick, layer by layer. And then we're starting to hopefully get to the point that we want to. It's just going to take, it doesn't happen a month, it takes years. Right, right. And, and you know, as a, from a staffing standpoint, it was, you know, just me and working out of a back of a weight room garage. And and I, I just, at that point, you know, you really have no choice but to go as hard as you possibly can or else the job won't get done. So I think to kind of uh, quickly wrap up that answer, I, from, from, from coach to coach, no matter who came in, they saw how hard I worked and 
a lot of it was just because I had no other choice. I just had to do what I need to do to get the job done. And at the end of the day, if I don't get the job done, the person who suffers is the athletes, you know, and I, I couldn't, that was always one of my mottos was just really trying never to let them down. Yeah. Let's, let's just slow roast it like a, cro- or like a crock pot, right? It's going to take multiple hours to get it done. Like, let's just do it that way. Do it the right way from the beginning, set this up in the right situation. So we're not trying to just do stuff too quickly and then we're, we're getting an uneven result that we don't want to have at the end of the day. Absolutely. Um, well, I think two big key words I took out of that is, is you were able to adapt, right, from coach to coach or from staff to staff that was coming in. Um, you know, sometimes for practitioners, that's very hard because you have a certain philosophy or mindset or, you know, this is how we did stuff here. Or if you're coming from another school, this is how we did stuff there. But in reality, you really have to listen to what's the coach's vision, right? What is the sports medicine, strength and conditioning? What is their mindset around this? Have they had a good experience with a dietitian or have they never had an experience with, with a dietitian in that case? There's a lot of those questions and things you have to seek out beforehand before we can start making our decision and how we want to start planning and, and moving forward with things. Because if everybody's not in agreement or their mindset's in a, in a different realm, right? for us to push certain things may not then be supported. And in that case, like then we're going to constantly have these, these battles over and over these conflicts that again, we, we don't want to have that in front of athletes. We don't want athletes to see us divided and it's overall not going to be able to help have us be able to put out the best product as a team. And the second thing was <clears throat> you showed, you showed a lot of value, right? You, you showed you could do the job. You showed you could advance it. You showed that, you know, athletes are coming to you first, right? Most people, if an athlete's coming to you first, that probably says something right away, right? And people are going to notice that, especially if you walk in a room and three or four guys are like, hey, Kyle, or hey, Sean, right? People are going to be like, you know, these guys really like that person or these guys really like gravitate to that individual. And that that speaks volumes at the end of the day. Like, you know, what one of my goals, what I try to do, you know, at Every place that I've been at, you know, if I know a, a whole new recruiting class was coming in, you know, I was I was on our scouting and recruiting staff. Who are we getting in? Who do you want me to talk to? Right. If we signed them or they're coming in on a scholarship or whatever it is, can I have their phone number? Right. Like in my mind, like I wanted to be the first one that was going to try to have a conversation with them. So before they even stepped foot on campus, which they are because they're going to they're do recruiting. But before they even get back for camp or something like that. Do they already know who I am? Am I already trying to help them so that day one, when they step on the campus, right, and they step into the weight room or the field or practice, whatever it is, they already know what the deal is. They already know what to expect. They already know what what it's going to need to be done in that first couple of weeks or the, the different offers that we provide versus coming in having zero clue. And then they're confused. They don't know what's going on. And then, again, in my mindset, like that doesn't look good on me. And at the end of the day, it sounds like you're kind of pretty similar. I'm never going to have my environment not be in a position that is at the highest possible standard level it could be when anybody's walking into that certain part of the room, the training table, out in the field, like stuff needs to look clean, ready, and good to go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and and as they come on campus, you know, it's a chaotic time for them. You know, like there's so much going on that <clears throat> they don't know and they don't understand. So if you've already reached out to them and they've already built or established, uh, you know, at least somewhat of a relationship with you. So amongst that chaos, as they step foot on campus, they're like, Oh, Oh, Sean. Yeah. I, I, re- I remember you, you know, I remember your face, your familiar face. So it's a little bit of comfort there. Right. Um, you know, as opposed to the opposite, if you don't kind of establish that relationship a little bit earlier on, you just become another member of the chaos. Yeah. And, and then that way, now you're the go-to guy. Oh, where do I go for that athletic training? Hey, who's the strength coach I got to talk yep. to? Hey, where are the offices at? Now you become the the go-to person each time they come in there. They, they always know that if I ask this individual a question, they're going to support and help me or they're going to guide me in the right direction. Um, I know we only got five minutes left. I think we should, again, and we could talk about this offline. I think a part two is possibly going to be coming here because we have a huge part to discuss with where you're currently at, at the University of Oklahoma with your transition into um, the sports science position. So I know there's a lot we can go into um, and to get into that. So I think I'm going to cut it here. I really appreciate you taking the time. 
um, to come on. I think, again, your background is going to be very unique for our viewers just because of what you were able to establish in Miami. Having that dual background, um, I think, makes a huge difference, you know, especially being able to honor the strength and conditioning side um, like we talked heavily about in this episode. Being able to know those certain other practitioners and their jobs and what they do goes a long way when it comes to communicating and talking the talk. You know, they, Absolutely. you understand their lingo and their language and what they're trying to do, then they're probably going to be able to support what you have to do because you understand the gender underlying of what's going on. But um, all his contact information is going to be below in the show notes. All my link tree digital links are going to be there as well. Supplement, food discounts, if you want to watch more uh, episodes of the podcast. Um, and then also all my social media is on there as well. I put um, every day one piece of free information, whether it's nutrition, strength, podcast episode. Um, I'll see in the social media space nowadays, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of things to be debunked. Um, so the more practitioners we can get onto those spaces, uh, to provide really high quality research backed information is going to be critical because you could probably tell me, Kyle, everyone's on a phone, right? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and no one's going to be getting off of it anytime soon. So the more we can adapt how we're going to educate and get information to these athletes, um, hopefully the better situation we can put them in. So they're not coming to us and saying, Hey, should I follow this cabbage soup diet? Or like, Hey, should I do intermittent fasting for 16 hours and like go out to practice? <laughs> no, probably not going to be the best idea because that's going to impact your performance. But hey, I put something out on my social media that talks about that to give you like the correct information if you got 30 to 60 seconds to watch this reel. Yeah. And honestly, that's it's so important because as they they do. They gravitate towards social media and you get those questions all the time. Hey, I saw this on Instagram. I saw this on this. And you you want them, you know, being able to utilize those resources to get information and get educated but we just you're right we need practitioners that have the the sports background the knowledge to give them provide them really sound advice and and so they're not following the latest fad that doesn't have anything to do with them being an athlete so absolutely yeah, and, that, and that's why i try to add you know on my social media sites strength coaches athletic trainers other dietitians you know, obviously athletes that were former athletes that are no longer involved, I'm involved with that are at other schools. Because again, it's, it's all about reaching as many communities as we can. And if we're able to do that and reach more people because people have larger followings, um, then hopefully we'll have a little bit more success uh, to be able to get the information out to uh, a larger mass of people. But everybody stay tuned. There could be a part two and you guys are going to really enjoy it. And I'm excited about it as well. But Kyle... Tuning off for now. Appreciate you. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate you.